Good morning, good morning. Wow, what a great crowd we have today. Hi. Yay, welcome. Hi, welcome. Oh, we got more joining us too, excellent. Good morning, happy election day. <laughs> oh, we, oh, I'm thrilled. Wonderful to see you all. Good morning, I hope you're all doing well. We got more people coming, excellent. Oh, great, we're going to, um, this is the, I think this um, largest crowd I've had since the summer. Excellent. Welcome, welcome. How many of you are joining us from home? Like you get to work from home on this. Excellent. That's nice, right? <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, we got more people coming. We're going to start right at 9 a.m. We're going to respect your time and uh, be very prompt with starting and ending. So um, I'm just going to give another minute for some more people to join. We had about 75 registrants today and about 35 of joined us so far, so I expect some more to be coming in. I, I really appreciate all of you who have been so prompt. So good morning. Um, I am going to go ahead and start and I'll just let people in as they come. Um, welcome to Tail D, Teaching Across Learning Environments. This is focused on how do we create positive learning experiences in multiple environments, whether that's in person, remote, blended, whatever environments those are. Um, they can also be <clears throat> unconventional environments. Um, I did some work with an alternative school district or the alternative school district this summer. And some of those learning environments are very different. So we're gonna be looking at principles and generalisms. Um, this um, and but focus today on authentic assessments. We are recording, but it's just really me who's being recorded and it's not going anywhere. So please feel free to do your thing, you know, <laughs> just participate to the fullest as much as you can. Um, I expect some of you will be joining me for all three sessions um, and some of you won't, and that's fine. We have a lot of flexibility in our offerings. So my name is Susan Midlarski. I'm an instructional and technical consultant. I was an IT specialist at MIT and I did get most of my master's in technology and education. So I am pretty well versed in multiple environments. Uh, I'm a curriculum writer in both ELA and math. And I have a book coming out. I just got the date yesterday, April 16th on making math more connected thank you <laughs> for, for life. So uh, I have over 20 years as an educator in both public and private schools. Thank you very much. I would love to learn a little bit about you. Um, can you put in the chat, and I love how engaged everybody is so far, um, what grade or grades you teach, what subject or subjects you teach, something about a, a favorite holiday, and in a minute or so, I'm going to launch a quick Zoom poll to find a little bit about your background with these courses, because that helps me customize today for you. Okay. Um, if it's okay with you, I'm going to go with first names, if you have your first name listed. If you'd rather I don't, you can rename yourself with um, your title and last name, um, just because it, I find them <laughs> easier to access sometimes. And okay, terrific. And please feel free to call me Susan. Wow. I'm watching the chat over here. That's why I'm going, wow. Uh huh. Excellent. We've got Christmas, Thanksgiving, uh, Resurrection Sunday, ICT, Halloween and Christmas, math teacher, first grade class. Wow, global history. Yesterday, I, I had a teacher in, in Tail F in the Monday afternoon session 
where she had just finished uh, successfully operating a Socratic dialogue. And I was so excited to hear that. I love Socratic dialogue. Okay, um, art specialist, woo, gratitude. That's fantastic. Okay, so I'm going to launch a poll now, um, which is just about your experience with these tail courses. Um, there's two questions. The first question is how many of our tail workshops, just the tail, have you attended? And if you've taken one or more before, I know it requires you, I should have changed that. Um, you can just leave that one. Well, if you haven't take, if you haven't taken any, just choose tail A. <laughs> it's gonna kind of mess the data, but it's okay. <laughs> awesome. Ah, look at that. A lot of Christmas lovers here. Okay. Uh, awesome, awesome, awesome. Summer vacation. <laughs> That's a good holiday. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's great. Okay. Oh, so we have some experienced folks here. Um, some of them have, some people have taken multiple courses. Um, I've heard from, I think, um, what is it, 78%. Uh, if you can't access the poll, it's totally fine, but I'm going to go ahead and close it. This is, this gives me a sense. So it looks like the majority of you are new to this. Um, and I'm going to show that to you. Um, the majority of you are new to this. Um, and therefore, I'm going to maybe say some stuff that might be repetitive to those of you who have been through a tail before. So uh, please have patience for those of us who are less experienced. Okay. Now, a few norms. We already talked about the names, if that's okay. Let me stop sharing the poll. Um, being here now, I mean, I'm thrilled at the number of cameras on I see. It just helps me so much to present to real faces. Um, besides that, even if your camera's off, if you can be present in the moment, it will make that much, make it that much more powerful for everyone, especially if we use breakout rooms, because participating and hearing from our colleagues is one of the things that makes these so valuable. Uh, we're gonna listen to all voices, start and end on time. That's my commitment to you. Um, working as a sub, oh my goodness, that's hard. <laughs> uh, taking an inquiry stance, we're going to be um, open to learning new things. I'm going to take responsibility for my impact. And that's a norm I request. Um, and ground statements and evidence. <clears throat> if evidence is your experience, that's evidence. <clears throat> okay. Um, so today, this is the fourth course out of six. If you haven't taken the first three, they're available. They will be starting a new round, I think, in a week or two um, in person. And then they're also available asynchronously. So you know best how you learn, uh, whatever way that is, in person, like live at the time or asynchronously. Uh, today, our essential questions are, how can we create assessments that are authentic and gain meaningful evidence of student learning? How can we uh, use the assessment cycle to improve student learning and feedback quality? So what we're going to do is understand what authentic assessment means, why it's important, identify the most effective feedback and assessment strategies, um, and reflect on our current assessments and consider how to adapt them for the future. I'm going to give you a link now to our note catcher. Uh, this note catcher is something we're gonna to refer to throughout the course. So let me put it into the link. Do I have a volunteer since we have such a nice large group today? Um, do I have a volunteer who can, if we have new people join us, just repaste it in to the chat as it comes around? Good morning, Mr. Ka, uh, Manjeet. I'm, we're using first names for this, so I hope everyone's okay with that. Okay, oh, Crystal, you'll do it? Thank you so much. Oh, fantastic. Okay, so the note catcher, it looks like this. 
We're going to go through some definitions that we're going to agree upon. And then we're going to have a couple of activities and we have new notes for those. Um, and then we have kind of an infor informational bonus page. So it will, <clears throat> when you click on the link, it will have you make a copy and that will save to your own Google Drive. So you're not seeing everybody else's notes, it's just your own. Feel free to ask any questions um, as the process goes through. Okay. So I think we can see that this is a, a pertinent quote. Actually, does that, someone want to read this out? So it's not just my voice this whole time. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead, Oleg. Good morning, everyone. The most effective feedback for students to receive is authentic, relevant, and actionable. Yes, thank you so much, Oleg. Oleg. Um, yes, authentic, relevant, and actionable. So these are our key terms, like I showed you in the, in the note catcher. I'm going to go through them now. What is the assessment cycle? It re refers to a pattern of activities, feedback, and assessment that highlights specific and timely teacher feedback. Applying student knowledge and performance-based meaningful assessments at the conclusion of the learning process. We are going to be modeling this, okay? Um, as we go through, we have a couple, obviously this is only a one hour session, so we can't do like a whole class or a whole like course, but I'm going to model a little bit of authentic assessment and uh, that's geared toward learning. And what we're going to be having is, you know how we had the Zoom poll at the beginning? Um, I'm going to be doing a couple of mini quizzes. And these mini quizzes are anonymous. They're low stakes. There's no grades attached. What they do is if you read the Make It Stick book by Peter C. Brown, um, it really talks a lot about how one of the ways to, like part of learning, as we know, students learn, we learn, and part of it is forgetting. We forget, right? <laughs> we forget most of what we learn. So how do we, it's natural, it's part of the process. So how do we interrupt the forgetting process? Part of that is by interrupting it with mini quizzes so we can go, oh, Oh yeah, and we reinforce that in our learning. Now there's a lot more to it, but this is just one strategy. So we're gonna do that a couple of times this session. So looking at the assessment cycle itself, um, we can see that it sort of starts with teacher, teacher guidance. That might be our lesson, it might be our activity, whatever it is, and feedback to the students. And these are the qualities in it, specific, timely, non-evaluative, manageable, and ongoing. You might see this as some ways of formative assessment, for example. Then the students get engaged. They, in the student-centered learning and engagement, they need choice, voice, attraction, persistence, and delight. I love that word, delight. <laughs> and then it sort of culminates, or the third stage is authentic assessments, where they have applied learning, it's performance-based, realistic, meaningful, and significant. That then informs the next cycle of teacher guidance and feedback. Um, I think we can recognize this as a best practice. We may feel a little bit hamstrung sometimes by the requirements in our school that don't give us an, enough space to do this all the time, but understanding the principles, we can do as much of it as we can. By the way, in case you don't know, and you may already know this, these workshops are funded by the New York State Education Department. Um, and good morning, Richard. Um, and they are really focused on best practices. So the NYSED is aware of our content and supports it. So as much as we can, right? So what is formative assessment? So just so we agree on the term, it consists of formal or informal feedback that informs instruction, right? So we look at how students are doing. We might walk around, we might have um, an entrance ticket, we might have whiteboards, we might have, you know, choral response. It's like all different ways. We might listen to how a student's reading, whatever it is. Um, you might have clickers or plickers. This then lets us know what we need to teach. If the students know already what we were planning to teach, we move on. If they don't, we may need to backtrack a little. Okay. 
summative ass assessment is like the tests or quizzes at the end of a unit of study, project evaluation, et cetera. Actionable feedback is feedback that you can take action on. Like I'll give an example for myself. We have a survey at the end. I get feedback every time. If a person says, this was great, I'm like, okay, cool. I'll keep doing what I'm doing. If a person says, and this doesn't happen often, luckily, but if a person says, um, I, I didn't love it, you know, I can't really take action on that, right? A grade isn't necessarily A, B, C, or D. It's, it's not necessarily actionable feedback. But when someone says the breakout rooms didn't work because people didn't participate, that's actionable to me. Right, I can do something about that the next time, or I can try anyway, the next time I give a workshop, right? So, and it's important too, I'm sure we all as teachers go through feedback sessions and observations and all of that. And we know the difference between what's useful and actionable and what isn't. So we really want to give them future oriented feedback. Summative assessment, okay, so I went too fast to that through that. It's formal feedback. It's like tests and quizzes. It might be a grade on a project. It's like a summary, like after you've done all the learning, um, what is the final product? Um, there's actually a good analogy. Did I, I? It might happen later, but I'll say it now in case it doesn't come up again. Um, think of going to a restaurant, right? When the soup, when the chef is making the soup and tasting it, that's formative assessment. When the chef serves it to the customers, that's summative assessment, right? It's the end product. Did they, did it come out okay? <laughs> okay, authentic, authentic assessment. Okay, great. Um, so authenticity is key for effective feedback, right? Um, we're looking at what is the uh, real world application of knowledge and skills. Um, and we want to include in that innovative thinking or problem solving for the learner. We want to prioritize different values and processes than conventional or historical. I don't even say typical anymore. It's more traditional um, because a lot of people are typically doing <laughs> better assessments or uh, more authentic assessments. So you know, think about it for yourself as a learner. If you're given a test that is disconnected from reality or usefulness, it's like you go through the motions, right? But you're not, your heart isn't in it, your mind isn't in it, your joy isn't in it for sure. <laughs> but if you're given something that you know is relevant, um, I'll give an example. You're, you know, you're at chef school and you need to make a certain kind of soup, then you're going to really try because you know this is going to be a useful skill. Um, so I, I remember in grad school, for example, getting my master's, there were some really good authentic assessments that we did. Um, I'll, in our special needs class, everyone had to pick a disability and wear it for a whole day. So some people like stuffed cottons in their ears, some people covered their eyes for the whole day, some people um, wore glasses that messed with their vision. You know, there's all different ways that they did it. And um, at the end of it, we had to write a paper about it. And that was a, an authentic assessment because we knew we could take that off at the end of the day, but our students can't and our friends can't. Um, and it really changed the meaning then rather than just reading some papers about it and writing, right? So we wanna give students tasks that give them application, understanding of skills and knowledge, help students feel empowered. Um, I know we have at least one math teacher, high school math teacher here or, or um, yeah, high school math teacher. Um, there's a course, a book called, I want to say Financial Algebra, which um, was developed in Long Island, and it is full of application. And I went to the, a talk by one of the authors once, and he talked about how um, one of the ways this was developed was 
he would have his students go to different car dealerships and ask about buying different cars and do all the math on what they were getting and how to negotiate and everything else. And not only did that help them understand all the algebra um, related to comparison, comparing car purchase options, including loans and everything else, it also helped them have that skill for that very real need in real life. So we need to help our students see how it's relevant and how they can use it outside of class. Let's take a look at some of the comparisons between conventional versus authentic. When we have typical tests, we're really looking for correct responses. And they the students can't know about them <laughs> in advance to be valid. I don't know if you've ever had that experience. Um, back in the day, I'm old. Um, <laughs> we had mimeograph machines. Um, and our teacher for world history, no, American history in high school, never fully erased the answer. She would copy things off and we could see <laughs> the answers were and it just didn't help our learning at all it was bad we got so lazy <laughs> um but we were checked out too because we didn't see the connections it wasn't it wasn't an engaging situation so an authentic task requires a high quality product or performance and a justification they need to justify solutions presented it they should know about it in advance the indicators of authenticity. It's not only about correctness, it's about justifications and the tasks and standards should be known and predictable. Um, they also typically um, are disconnected from the real world and isolate skills or facts, authentic tasks. Really, um, this is one of the things that I learned in the Make It Stick book that was really interesting. Um, one thing that we tend to think about when learning is practice one skill a lot until you get it and then you've mastered it. Well, actually opposite. Our brains learn better when we interleave different skills and topics together. It actually, it's very interesting. I highly recommend the book if you get a chance. Um, and they're also tied, tied to real world contexts and constraints. Um, they, these contexts and constraints are like those that practitioners in the real world experience. It's multifaceted, it's complex, even if there is a right answer. So this is more like a traditional um, assessment that I'm about to give because it's a mini quiz. But again, this has a different goal than authentic assessment. This has the goal of this or the objective of this is to um, help you interrupt your learning. Uh, inter no, interrupt your forgetting, sorry, and improve your learning. So I'm going to quiz, uh, launch this quiz. It says, which of these is found in authentic and not conventional assessment? Must have correct answers. Students must justify answers, isolate skills. So go ahead and take a moment to answer that. Great. Okay, we have 35 responses. Excellent. See if we can get a few more. Okay. Forty-one. I just want to give everyone enough time to, to answer it. Okay. We've still got a couple ends. It's like watching the popcorn pop. <laughs> You're waiting until it slows down enough to stop <laughs> to pull it out of the microwave. Okay, or the pot, whatever. Okay, we have forty-five, which is almost everyone. So I'm going to end it here. The popcorn has stopped. Um, so the correct answer was that justifying answers is found in authentic and not um, conventional. So um, this is the results for everyone to see. And I'm just going to go back. Now, remember, I'm 
modeling the interruption of forgetting. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back and I noticed that a few people missed that one. So I'm going to show again that slide that goes through that, right? So typical tests or traditional tests contain items that isolate skills or facts, right? Whereas um, if you go to the previous one, justification is highlighted in authentic tests, okay? Um, correct responses is also in typical tests. Now, and then in authentic, correctness is not the only way, okay? Okay, so you have been such an amazing group so far. Um, I'm really excited to work with you. I'd like to give you a minute to, con to think about activity number one. Now, for those of you who um, came in late, um, I'm, or later, I'm going to, I've just pasted in, thank you so much, Crystal, <laughs> I did it before you. Um, um, we both <clears throat> pasted in <clears throat> the link to the note catcher, which is here. And this is activity one, okay? The idea is to look on page two of your note catcher and reflect for a minute about what are some of the barriers that you encounter to implementing authentic tasks and assessment. Um, and then consider, um, yeah, just for this part, we're just going to take a minute to talk about and then share some barriers. So go ahead and think, and as you wish, you can put that in the chat. So Kellyanne, <clears throat> it's going to uh, force you to make a copy that will then save in your own Google Drive. So you need to be logged into your Google account and then it'll save. Um, is it not working? Is anybody else having trouble? Okay, one, one person. Um, all right, so... Um, Danielle, the only thing I can think of is maybe you're not logged into a Google account. Um, it finally came up. It was just giving me, it was just spinning and spinning, but it finally came up. Sorry. Oh, no problem. I hate connection issues. <laughs> Yesterday in the middle of a uh, writing group that I attend, not in the middle, I was right at the end of reading a piece to everyone and my power flicked off. <laughs> so annoying. Okay. Okay, so we're getting some very good input here. Time is a very popular um, very popular response. Language, micromanagement, yeah. Yeah, I hear you on that. Uh, the time to design one, time, time. Um, if students don't understand. So that's actually kind of the point of um, authentic assessment is to make sure we know if the students understand, and if not, how do we then make it so that they can understand? Setting up the data collection tool, yep, mm -hmm. time, language barrier, mm. oh my goodness, lack of self-confidence. Now that is, <sighs> so Gyasi, um, or, so one thing I would say about that is, um, that is something that we can address through some of my other learning environment courses or some of the other courses that we go into in the other threads, which I'm just going to take a quick moment to share with everyone since we have so many people now. We have a lot of options. You may have already seen them, but um, we have a lot of different options here focused with hour-long courses, they're all CTLE courses. 
So they can be taken either synchronously or asynchronously. Um, so some of the issues that we're discussing can be addressed with some of our other courses as well. Um, yeah, Oleg, that's part of our that's part of our challenge <laughs> is to get them used to it. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, some can read and some can't. That's really hard. Children lose focus. And that's where having authentic, engaging tasks and assessments can change the level of focus. When students are curious about something, they stay focused. Yeah. Mm. And you know what, Hannah, this is the thing is like when we have um, our state tests are supposed to be designed to reflect how the outcomes are on the authentic work. So if we focus too much on the traditional assessments, we're actually undermining student success. And some administrators don't even answer that. Yes, the courses are all free, Kenya. Okay. Uh, they are funded, as I mentioned before, by NYSET, by the New York State Education Department. Okay, let's take a look at some of the barriers that you all have mentioned and also we are, <laughs> I think we're all agreed on most of these. We have time and energy constraints. We have demands of mandated conventional assessments. We have lack of technology and we have lack of familiarity. If you're not familiar and fluent in something, it's a lot harder. Like someone who was kind of raised as a baby teacher inside a climate of authentic assessments, it's part of what they do. It's like breathing, right? Um, but if you haven't, if you've been raised in a climate of, you know, typical assessments, traditional ones, then that is a lot harder. It's a whole new learning process for everyone. Um, how can we do some authentic feedback implementation? Well, one thing is we need to engage our students more. I think it was tail C or tail B where we really talk about that some more, um, where it's students are important partners in the learning. And when we realize that it's not on all on our shoulders to do the teaching, actually lightens the load a lot. And it lets us to be a lot more deliberate and intelligent in our approaches, rather than um, kind of scrambling like a, a squirrel on, or a hamster on a wheel <laughs> to get through the days and everything. Reformulated rubrics, student feedback loops. We'll talk about that in a minute. So taking a look at each of these in order. Quality peer fat feedback. If we think it's the feedback job is all on us, oh my gosh, you know, grading becomes this overwhelming, terrible <laughs> mass of stuff. But when we can design and implement effective peer review, which can be done even at the youngest ages, and we develop strong feedback culture within our classroom, we can not only lift the burden from ourselves, it actually improves student learning because as they're assessing, they're also learning. They're learning about what they can do better next by reading their peers' work. Um, Part of this, of course, is we need to have a safe and responsive classroom culture and environment. It won't work if there's so much bullying and all this, right? We need to have it be safe. And that's part of the work in the whole tale and, and all these other courses. Um, so some of the things it does, it fosters students' objectivity. It improves critical thinking skills, motivation, and they become more engaged. I remember when I was in the classroom full time, you know, having students, when I trained my students to give each other feedback, um, they were really excited and they were really good at it. They got better and better as the years went on. So how can we encourage them or train them to be good feedback givers? Um, the instructions to give it has to be clear and detailed. Make criteria that's goal referenced, tangible, actionable, timely, and, and consistent. The next goal or the next strategy is to reformulate rubrics so they prioritize um, active learning. And I have a link for you. Let me get it. 
Um, I need to get to the right slide in my other window. And here we go. Okay. So we have to avoid confusing learning outcomes with tasks, quantities, or numerical sc scores. Okay. We're looking for, so our outcomes, our objectives need to um, reflect really what we want to see the students be able to do, be able to know, be able to perform, right? Um, we, they should be, the rubrics should give proficiencies, like the student is proficient at this, that, or the other thing after this task. So try and do this kind of rubric, uh, descriptive, proficient, outcome focused, rather than a checklist. Now, some of you might be saying this is a lot of notes to take. You might be screenshotting, you might be, you know, whatever. You don't need to. I will let you know that in the um, note catcher at the end, there is your own copy of the slideshow. Okay. So you'll have that afterwards. So that might help you if you want to stay present um, throughout this session. Okay. How can we reformulate our rubrics? Well, really focus on high quality learning outcomes. Consider which tasks you'll use for these and select which criteria and descriptions of success you'll use for these tasks. We saw in the introduction that we have a huge uh, range of topics and grade levels we're teaching here in this, in this grouping. So to be more specific about a rubric or how or so on, it would only reach a small segment of people. So we're really dealing in general terms in these one hour courses, but the principles should be useful. Um, if you would like more in-depth coaching, you can reach out. We do have embedded job embedded school coaches that can come out to your school. Okay, strategy three, student feedback loops. That's where um, we Basically, it's like the assessment cycle that I showed before. You know, it starts with one thing, moves to the next, moves to the next, and comes back to the first, but we're at a new level now, right? So we want to make sure that um, students continue to have ongoing feedback, improving feedback, and understand where they are in it. Like, if they did improve in something, yay, they should get some notes for that, and then their next steps as well. It's very easy to see in uh, subjects like art and music and dance because some of those are more concrete um, improvements to measure. Um, we need to find ways to do that in all of our subjects. Okay, let's take a look at an example. We begin with a learning outcome. Okay, we explain this target to uh, students very clearly at the beginning of the lesson. Then we have a feedback exchange. We give students formative feedback that is specific, non-evaluative, manageable, and clearly tied to the outcome. Then they give our well, then we give our students time to revise and apply that feedback. Finally, there is reflection on the process. Now, reflection can be um, verbal. You can hear from the students how it was for them. It can be written. It can be your own reflection. See how well it worked as you grow as a student leader. Leader of students, I should say. <laughs> now we have a little video. Let me make sure I've got, I'm just sharing sound. Um, And this one will cover that. It's just a couple minutes long. Um, it's about four minutes of a six minute video. Okay. Let me know if you have trouble hearing. Effective feedback depends on what students, not teachers, do with feedback comments across a unit of study. 
However, there are several pieces of advice collected from the associated literature and the international higher education Twitter community that are worth bearing in mind when giving constructive and actionable feedback to students. Do ensure you use accessible language that clearly communicates and breaks down the expectations surrounding assessment tasks into manageable steps and includes a description of what specific terminology means within your context, such as critical evaluation or analysis. Don't rely on shorthand symbols and comments where the meaning and intended direction for future work are hidden as a result of the students not having been supported to develop a shared understanding of the requirements of the assessment task or academic conventions underpinning the discipline, which can lead to frustration and dissatisfaction with the feedback process. Do focus on the student's work and providing advice on how it can be developed so that comments focus on a particular section, sentence or specific aspect of the work. This provides evidence of engagement and connection with the work and demonstrates a belief in its developmental potential. Don't focus on the personal attributes of the student, as this can have an impact on their self-confidence and can result in deactivating emotional reactions such as frustration and defensiveness which can interfere with engagement with current and future feedback comments. Do provide balanced feedback containing three elements. One, strengths, or the aspects of the work that students should repeat in future. Two, areas for improvement, or the aspects of the work that students should avoid repeating in future. And three, advice, or suggestions for how these areas for improvement could be addressed in future work. Each of these three elements should be accompanied by an explanation as to why it is a strength or area for improvement and is significantly more likely to be acted upon if this explanation incorporates specific examples from the student's work. Don't rely on feedback that is separated or disembodied from the student's work as it can be difficult for students to see how the comments relate to their work and therefore how it can be acted upon to improve future work. The provision of detailed and specific feedback has been found to underpin what many students consider to be the most effective feedback. Do support students to develop a shared understanding of the expectations surrounding standards through the provision of clear and accessible opportunities for engagement with assessment briefings, feedback on drafts from teachers or peers, accessible and possibly student-created marking criteria and evaluation of exemplars, for example. Don't focus feedback comments entirely on identifying errors or justifying the grade to an external examiner without explanation as to why it was an error or how to move the work up to the next level. In the absence of such explanation, this can lead to frustration and disillusionment with the feedback process, which can result in students disengaging from future feedback. And finally, do focus on providing a small number of action points that will have the most positive impact on the future development of the work or learner. Within each action point, focus on clearly explaining a key area for development, linking this into a specific example from the student's work if possible, and providing suggestions for how to address it in future work. Don't overwhelm the students with too much feedback. Markers commonly feel under pressure to provide more and more detailed feedback to students. However, the provision of a small number of action points is a much more effective means of encouraging students to engage with their feedback than providing lots of feedback that can actually result in disengagement from the feedback process. Therefore, effective feedback identifies three key areas of student work. The strengths of the work that should be repeated, the areas in which the work could be improved, and advice for how to address each area for improvement, which should involve the use of accessible language that focuses on the work being assessed, that supports students to develop a shared understanding of expectations and standards more akin to the assessors, and that identifies two to three action points that will be most useful for the student to work on in future. Okay, so hope that was interesting. Um, we are going to now do our second Zoom quiz. Okay. The question is, from the video, which is most important not to do when giving feedback? Make the feedback about the student themselves, make this the feedback actionable, make the feedback balanced, strengths and areas for improvement. 
Remember the question is, which is most important not to do? Wow, you guys are quick. Look at this, this is fantastic. And the objective of this again is interrupting the forgetting process. I keep repeating myself partly because we keep getting new people in. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, waiting for the popcorn to slow down. This is great. Um, so it also helps to make it more memorable, right? Whatever it is that you're quizzing on. How many of you have used plickers with a P? Plickers? A few people. I love them because they're low tech, except for your end. And they're a really great way to prepare like little moments of this um, and interrupt student forgetting. Okay, so we have 79, 81% oh, of our people have participated in this. Um, that's pretty good. So I'm going to end this now. And so I'm going to share the results. Wait a second. Um, well, the correct answer, I'm not sure why it's not showing up here. Maybe I didn't mark it right, but the correct answer, which is most, yeah, I did. Uh, wait, I don't know why it chose the wrong one. The correct answer is the first one. Make the feedback about the student themselves. That's the correct answer, okay? And um, I'm not gonna go back to that slide because that's the video. <laughs> We're not gonna rewatch the video, but you can because it's in your copy of the slideshow, all right? Um, so yeah, the correct answer about what we should not do is make it personal. We know that. No one wants to hear, oh gosh, you're a bad teacher, <laughs> for example. <laughs> All right, great work, everybody. Okay. Um, if you were thinking, if you took out the word not, then, um, then the C would have been a good answer. I need to fix that error. Okay. So let's do some revision now. Um, we're going to answer some questions again in the note catcher. I think we're all caught up on the note catcher, but Crystal, if you want to paste it again, you can. Um, and I really appreciate your help with that. That was awesome. Um, so we have two questions. Um, one is one kind of task or assessment you now use that you would like to improve. And think to yourself, how could you transform it into an authentic task? The second step is identify one or two specific strategies you'll implement or other changes you'll make to provide your students with authentic feedback in the future. Then share one or both of your answers into the chat when you're done. So this is a bit longer. I want to give you, normally I would go into breakout rooms, but that usually ends up taking too much time at this stage. So I'm gonna give you four minutes to reflect, think, and write, because I'm sure you'll have a lot of thoughts and feel free to add them and anything else from the chat that you see is useful into your note catcher. I'm going to go silent to let you think for a few minutes.
Valerie, no, you're fine. I, probably, I'm just silent to let people think for a few minutes. We're going to come back in another minute. I'm seeing such great ideas and, and thoughts in the chat. This is really fantastic. Um, hmm. I do, I do appreciate, I, I, I hope people are able to copy paste from the chat because this is really good. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff here and um i'm going to say like oleg you're you're right but i wonder if you can use peer feedback to help relieve the burden on you um there might be ways to do that and an exo slip doesn't have to be a multiple choice or even just a numerical answer it can be you know, um, what is one question you have from this lesson or um, which, what do you understand this concept to be? Like it can be a description and you can then look at, and it can be done on Google Forms if they have technology, it can be done on paper, whatever it's easiest for you. And you can just scan through that one question and see where students are. Another strategy, and I'm just gonna mention this, um, that has worked well in many classrooms is as students leave the classroom, there's like literally an exit slip, um, you have three different pockets for them to deposit their answers in, their exit slips. Um, one for I got it, one for I'm still working on it, and one for I'm lost. And that well, just the amount of paper in each of those pockets will let you know in a starting point how well you did getting that concept across. <laughs> and usually people are pretty good, students are pretty good at self-assessing um, and it can let you know, do I need to revisit this topic maybe in a different way? Do I need to um, pair people up according to what they wrote? You know, it's like there's a lot of different ways that you can launch a, a lesson where you utilize student expertise and not just your own. Hmm, this is great. Hmm, time is always an issue, I agree. Um, yeah, sometimes peer feedback is more helpful. <laughs> Teresa, thank you for that. You know, it, it depends and it also depends on age. Um, oh, I like this. Oh, wow, that's so detailed, Lily. My goodness. Yeah, one of the things that you can do to, to save time is like create a few different um, types of feedback that you know you, you give a lot, like actionable feedback. For example, if you're teaching writing, it could be um, review your work for complete sentences. I'm just spitballing, right? I'm just like saying stuff. Um, but then you can print them on a bunch of labels and just peel off the labels and stick them accordingly. So um, there are ways to get smart about how to do it. Or you can have in your rubric um, specific things you're looking for, actionable things. Students know that they're looking for it. And you can simply say, refer to number three, um, you know, excellent job on number four, you know, you can find ways to be more efficient in your feedback. So this is really good. Yes, 
yes, this final, I, I, I agree. Um, again, like I hope everyone is able, you can even just copy paste the whole thing and put it into your note catcher and sort it out later. We have some people who seem to be dropping out and joining again. Okay, so we're almost at the end. We have five minutes left. You guys are amazing. I'm very impressed. So you can, like I said, um, scan one of these, use the one in your note catcher, whatever, and sign up for more CTLD credits. And we have um, this promotion going on. If you get six DOE staff members to any of our courses, you get a $50 gift card. Um, use your referral code. <clears throat> and then we have our sur survey. So the survey, I, I'll just mention that we have had some issues with the DOE email. We, they seem to be sorted, but in case, just in case we are asking for your personal email too, so that we can guarantee that you get your CTLA certificate. Um, so that is the survey. Um, take your time to complete it. I'm sure, you know, I do take your feedback very seriously. So I'd love to hear what you have to say. And finally, um, if you have any questions or feedback, you can talk to me now. I'll stay on for a few extra minutes. Um, you can email me at this address or you can email admin if you have issues with your CTLEs. And I expect I'll be seeing some of you later today. We'll be starting again at 1030 with PLE. Um, so thank you so much. That concludes this session other than your own filling in the survey. Um, feel free to go or ask questions or say something as you please. And like I said, you've been an amazing group. Thank you so much. Um, Melissa, here's the survey. Thank you. No problem. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you, Oleg. Thank you so much. Have a good day. You too. Thank you, Danielle. Thanks to everyone in the chat as well. Excuse me, Miss. How how can I scan? I how can you? How can you? Sorry. I I wanted to scan the barcode, but I didn't scan. Okay, so it's in your it's in your note catcher as well. But here it yeah, is. Yeah, one second. Sure, no problem. One question, please. Sure. Um, I didn't see an indication for CTLA credit. Is this? CTLE credit? Yes, these are all CTLE credit courses. You'll be, after you send in your survey, you'll get your certificate. Okay, because I've done more before and I've got none at all. So what you need to do is contact admin. Like I said, we had a period of time when DOE addresses, it was all, we all of our emails were getting filtered out. They were just getting blocked. So, okay. you know, it was out of our control, um, but if you email admin solved, then you'll get, um, you'll hear back from them. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So it's, it's right there. Admin at solvedconsulting.com. Okay. This is also in your note catcher. One, one second, please. Sure. I'll go back to the code. There you go. You can also go to solvedconsulting.com where we have all of our courses. Okay, thank you, Richard. Um, Beverly, uh, the survey is here. 